All right, there you go. Thank you. So hi, everybody. Welcome to the Chaos University work group. Uh, it's nice to have all of you here today. Minutes are in the chat. I'm going to share my screen. Uh, today's big question. Claire, we're going to wait your answer. Okay, good. <laughs> yeah. You're still part of the part of the club. That's great. So um, I, I do want to point out just a, a real quick thing here, this first point. Um, right now in the chaos project, we are renaming, looking to rename the bus factor metric. And Don had put together kind of a, a issue and an associated um, vote on what you think of as a rename. So you can click on those links there. Uh, essentially, bus factor is a bit of a morbid name for a metric. So it implies being hit by a bus. Um, and so anyway, there are a couple options there. Please feel free to take part in that discussion. We're not really going to discuss it here, but we're just making sure to bring this to every working group just so you understand that this is now a point. Yep, and the poll closes at the end of the week. And the poll closes at the end of the week, so you got two days to make your vote. All right. Um, today we're going to talk, we have both Mike and Sean, so thanks for joining us today. Um, we're going to kind of have both of them talk about um, lessons learned about using metrics in, in their own particular settings. So I think that should make sense to a lot of people, just that topic. So Mike, do you want to share your screen or do you just want to talk or how do you want to go about doing it? Uh, I got a super simple Word document that yeah. just lists off some stuff. I think it would be just as easy if I talked. If people want something visual, it's not really it's just a listing of, of words. Do you want to um, share that document or no? Sure, if you want. Yeah, I can, <laughs> I can drop it in here. It's it's uh, not particularly... Uh, yeah, it's not, it's not particularly um, interesting or... I'm sure it's very interesting. Like that. I'm sure uh, it's exceptional, Mike. <laughs> it's it's that. That's that's what it is. That is perfect. Um so yeah. It's uh one sec, let me bring it up. So I was I was talking with um my boss, Steve, about this and uh and so on. And in general, um when we think about things that we're measuring. Uh, regarding the work that we're doing, it really breaks down into three separate parts. And I'm actually going to go from the bottom up here. So the most important metrics that we measure are metrics that we have predefined in existing grants that our center is operating on. So like, I, I assume everyone here is, is at least familiar with Open RIT, but we're like an OSPO. And Pretty much our entire team, except for our director, Steve, is is being funded by soft money. So in general, all of our operations are running based on existing grant programs that you know we are fulfilling. So for instance, an example of what these metrics are that we've worked off of are like, we had a grant with the Sloan Foundation where we will work with 30 separate projects um, to do community building activities uh, to help, you know, these 30 projects that we've worked with uh, build open source communities around their works. And so the metrics that we were working with were um, the specifically how many grants, how many projects we had worked with so far, uh, the exact deliverables that we provided each of these projects, and then you know essentially like a uh, like a customer satisfaction score based on a, a survey that we had with these people. Um, and this is like you know specifically things that we have to report to the donors, uh, and is very particular to like a you know a set of activities based on a contract that we provided. And I think this is quite different than how a lot of people, when they come into, uh, in, in general, in this meeting, think about metrics, because a lot of the times we're thinking about like longer term, you know, metrics around impact and sustainability at the university level. 
And largely for us, that hasn't necessarily been the case because we're more focused on delivering individual programs and our, I would say like our horizon has been much shorter for, for better or worse. Uh, this carries on into the second group of metrics that which is largely around like sort of more respect, impact, um, kind of like, uh, yeah, like the, the sort of what we've contributed to the academic sector. And so for this, we're usually oftentimes trying to keep track of like the amount of conferences we presented at, uh, what sort of papers we published, um, like have we participated in other forms of media like podcasts or, you know, less formal articles. Um, the amount of sort of projects that we've worked with people on, a lot of times we'll have like these pretty small dollar, like they aren't like big funded grants, but we'll, we'll assist, uh, for instance, like a researcher who's doing a project, you know, we try to keep track of the amount that we've, uh, the amount of various research projects or third party projects that we've impacted over the course of a year. Um, our network is, is usually quite important, you know, the different universities we're working with, the different institutions, um, potential funders, uh, and then satisfaction among those people. And then as well uh, as among student groups that we work with, RIT has a pretty large, um, I guess it's not, it's not, it's not formally a club, but it's like a student club around open source software, as well as our uh, curriculum that we give, um, you know, has, has quite a lot of students involved in open source. Uh, with that, we host a lot of events and stuff like that for students and, you know, also like more formal events like the Open Work Summit that we host at. And then finally, the last, uh, the last sort of section of metrics is, is really like, because we're run on a sort of contract to contract basis or a grant by grant basis, uh, we think really hard about our sales process. Uh, so uh, yearly grant income is super important. Uh, and we measure that against our expenditures, uh, the amount of proposals that we're writing that we have in the pipeline, uh, as well as like conversion rate and stuff like that, you know, how, like how much effort are we putting into writing proposals? How many of those proposals are getting converted for the conversion rate? Like, are we making a profit on it? And then we have done um, a fair amount of work in trying to like come up with a sort of total addressable market number which for us is like when thinking about the academic sector and funding of open source work that we think applies to us, like what is the total number uh, of that in particularly in the US? Um, so then we can understand like how much market penetration we have. So a lot of people I've spoke to uh, particularly in academia, they've really focused on what I think are like metrics around respect and impact. But when I think about metrics that are really key to our survival as an institution, um, I think it's actually been the the sales and revenue and then like how well you're doing on grants um, has been in our case. Uh, with this in mind, I, I want to be really clear, like our our open source office is not deeply integrated with university leadership. We don't have a lot of buy-in. Um, it's not that there's like skepticism around the work that we're doing. It's just more of like ambivalence. Um, and so I think that really makes us need, at least within our institution, to focus very uh, intensely on sort of more economic factors where I, you know, I think it could be potential. Like if you have a university president that sees what you're doing is valuable or is bought into maybe like an investment into your office in hopes that it will be paying off long-term uh, metrics around like the respect and impact area might be more important and more like you might be more rewarded by achieving growth in those instead. Uh, so that was like really quick run through, but I'm 
curious about what folks think about this. And I, I'd be happy to have like a discussion around this stuff. I know Sean is also presenting, so I, we can hold it off yeah, until I, yeah, you can funny. finish, Mike. I mean, I don't, I don't have a long presentation. <laughs> cool. No, this is Not like great. you're holding me up. I have a, a number of questions, but I'd like to see what other people's reaction is to this first. Um, I had a question about uh, sort of how you go about working um, with projects. So this would be respect and impact the number two projects we have assisted when you're sort of evaluating the impact that you have on those projects, is it mostly like these projects are coming to you with ideas um, on, and then you're sort of evaluating how much you can help them with maybe what they're coming to you for, or is it more open-ended where you, you get connected, but then you have to sort of come up with those uh, measurements of impact as well. Um. Yeah, great question. Um, so I'm not like an expert on sales pipelines, which is probably saying something given that I'm essentially doing a lot of sales work in this role. But like, uh, as I understand it, there's kind of inbound sales and outbound sales. So inbound is like, uh, talks about the pipeline when someone comes to you, right? When they discover your office and we get people that come to us, they're like, Hey, you know, I heard about the, the presentation you gave, or like, we saw this thing on your website and I got this project and I'm wondering if you guys can be, um, uh, useful for it. And so a lot of times in cases like this, we sort of have like a menu of services that are sort of pre-canned, like, you know, we'll have a, like a half pager or a one pager document saying, oh yeah, like, oh, you're looking to do open source community building stuff. Like here's our sort of documented evidence-based process that we do to help projects give communities. This is like the rough sort of figures and funding. Um, we get people that come to us that are like interested in using us as a recruitment service for students. So like um, they're interested in hiring students to do some sort of open source work and, you know, stuff like that. And so when people come to us, oftentimes we're presenting them with items on a menu of like, here's the standard services that we oftentimes provide. Um, and sometimes it's kind of like heavy lift stuff, sometimes not. And then on the flip side of that, we're oftentimes looking for opportunities that are usually much bigger in scope. Um, so for instance, we're like, building a, a piece of software called Mystic, uh, for instance. And we wanna, you know, we wanna fund building this piece of software out into like a fully fledged uh, product and stuff like that, that can be used and it'll be integrated into uh, other chaos um, software services. And we're we're looking for funders that can assist us, that, that can fund these things. We're looking for partners that we could potentially work with. Um, and like a lot, a lot of our work is is trying to get those bigger uh, those bigger contracts to keep us around so we can also help out the smaller ones that come to us. Um, Francesca, I hope that kind of it was a bit rambly of yeah, an answer. No, but... but the the menu concept was uh, especially helpful. Thank you. Cool. Well, uh, so Mike, I see David. Mike, before you before we go to David, do you? Are those documents you can share with people, like the menu that you mentioned? Uh, yeah, when I say menu, we don't actually have like a nicely laid out, here's the options, but we have like specific documents, like we have um, like a two pager that describes our kind of uh, community consulting method. Um, and But usually like the menu is a basic uh, email that like will attach that, like, some, okay. A lot of times people will come to us with like, oh, what license should I use? Or like, what's the process for releasing a piece of open source software at our university? And we have like a, you know, uh, like a rubber stamping document that gets sent to our uh, IP office. If there are things you could share, that would be great. I yeah, think I can. It might, it might help other people. For sure. I can do that. Okay, right on. Um, okay, David, thank you. 
Hey, um, this is really interesting. When you got to the third part, the grants part, it sounded incredibly corporate to me. I've having 25 years of industry, like that's the kind of things that I was presented in our, you know, overhead, um, all hands kind of meetings. Um, and then when you talked about not really having buy-in from your, your administration, I know we're all like with the Sloan Foundation grants, we all are like looking for our our future. Um, have you tried? It sounds like you have a you may have some really nice kind of return on investment ROI metrics there. Um, are, do they not resonate? Have you not tried to talk to administration about that? Do you have any ideas about that? Yeah. So I would say, uh, I mean, uh, full full disclosure, transparency. I don't think uh, I don't think we've made profit in this way. Like, I don't think we're in a in a great place financially. Um, in terms of discussions we've had with our university, now I think Steve, my boss, could speak towards that more because um, I really haven't had. I haven't been allowed into the, the 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 meetings with the important people at our university, um, but my uh, my my take takeaway from these discussions is the university administration says, well, you know, if you're such so financially viable, then we don't need to worry about you, and if you do require investment from the university. Um, you know, we need like specific proof that we will like we need a guarantee that we will get return on investment. Um, there's a lot of particularly within our administration, there's a lot of hesitation around uh, investing in anything that isn't, you know, uh, guaranteed to, to bring that money back because of, you know, the economic situation, I guess, with within academia in the U.S., Mike, when you say guarantee, are, are you literal or are they just looking for some reasonable assurance that there's a probability of a guarantee of return? Because guarantee seems very hard for an academic environment. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I was I was hoping it would be uh, kind of more probable, but you know the the main arguments we've made is uh, trying to you know we've tried to do a good job of showcasing the potential for profit and, you know, uh, existing leadership in this field and how it sets us up to succeed. Uh, if there was like just a little bit of investment in the university, um, particularly in like making one of our positions kind of hard money positions for a year or two. Uh, and that was not enough uh, from, from our university administration's perspective. So you know, I think it's possible that you could get like uh, we could get our president's office or research office to pay for, you know, maybe like a part time student or two or something along those lines. Uh, but that's about as far the amount of investment that um, they have shown willing. Uh, Thanks, Dave, Mike. Mike. Yeah, I was that gonna say, do you have any follow up questions, David? Or are you good? No, I got to get my resume ready, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I didn't mean this. Like, this is this is our university. I, you know, uh, I, I don't think, yeah, I, this is purely only the last couple of years. So I don't want to, like, be doom and gloom. But this is uh, certainly the, the response we've had from our administration. I do not think every university is going to be like this, but I may be wrong. Um, Great. Yeah. Thanks for taking these questions, Mike. Um, no Claire, you're you're next. So yeah, I just wanted to comment that too because I think it's 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 an interesting one because like I I I would never have been putting things like revenue you can get from open source as the top of my list coming into this discussion, um, but I want to. I suppose, reinforce that that is a discussion that happens quite frequently. So so um, I'm going to comment on the uh, something that's been happening in the Irish ecosystem. We were talking about the value of open source with a number of folks who happen to be in the TTO office, noting that the OSPO and Trinity is in the TTO office, but there's a few others that are involved in a project that we're working on around open source policies. And there was a big discussion around, do we try to sell, like, 
educate the powers that be about open source and the value of open source and yada, yada, yada. I mean, the answer is yes, we want to try and do that. But there was a kind of a notion to say, if you're telling, if you're talking to them about value and there's a potential to translate the impact of open source into something they're already measuring, then that might be an easier way to prove the value of open source rather than trying to educate them as to new ways in which open source has value. So this is the discussion around the idea that, you know, uh, open source projects that are that aren't um, like so say research that's done it as an open source project with an open source project output may not be IP that you would license or sell as a university. However, um, and, and so then all the, the university people go, well, they're, they're giving up revenue. Uh, not that they would have ever licensed it anyway, but there's this notion in their head that they're putting out something for free that they should be monetizing. Right. This is there's a there's a set of people who are thinking that in the university. And and so there was a big discussion about the idea that, well, we, we can make the point that we can still get money for this. It's just not in an IP licensing way. And I suppose the point I just wanted to make was that's the reason we had this guy, Tobias, Tobias Gabriel from SAP. And he was giving evidence <laughs> evidence in, in, in our event about the idea that SAP pay for research and they explicitly ask for the output to be an open source because that's easier for them to consume. So we were trying to make the point, well, actually, maybe there's a pathway for the university to get more money from corporates if you do open source outputs because they really don't like this IP transfer lark that's going to take six months for them to negotiate. So if you if you want to talk about really good industry collaborations as a university, maybe open source is a way to actually increase your ability to get money from, from, from corporates. Um, and that really resonated. So uh, with the TTO officers, or at least they got very excited about telling that story rather than being asked to educate us to the value of open source under the principles we would normally educate on, uh, as, as to the value of open source, like social impact, because that was going to be harder to sell. That was just the conversation that had, was, had happened. I appreciate that, Claire. Um, Mike, do you want to respond to that? Yeah, um, a really, really great point you brought up there, Claire. And certainly... Um, from our case, I think what, one of the main arguments we made to our administration was was less around, you know, American tech sector like has been going through a thing recently, and you know, there's a lot of hesitation. But when we made the argument to our um, our administration, we pointed to like Pose and the Nelson memo and all these things, saying, "Oh, look, like open source and." open source software, open data and practices surrounding around that. If you, your university can support that, that can make researchers at this university more likely to bring in grant funding and push our grant funding up. And, you know, RIT wants to become an R1 university supposedly. And so like this could help them in that goal. Um, and so it got some movement. Our, our biggest piece of feedback was kind of like, well, you know, just like put a, put a page on our what university website that tells everyone how to do it. And it like, that's, that's the amount of support that's required. It's not necessarily something that we need to have an office for. We don't think, um, which, you know, obviously I, I personally disagree with that, but that was, you know, uh, one, one sort of piece of feedback we got, uh, based on how we communicated it. Thanks for that. Um, Stephanie, I'd love to hear what you have to say. Yeah, I mean, I just wanted to say yes, yes, and yes to whatever Claire was, what, what Claire was saying with regards to how I see, we see industry engagement here at UCSC and our experience with it. We don't have as many, we haven't, we, we're just getting started on some of the, um, what we call like the open source sponsorship uh, gift agreements, but it is the exact reason that Claire was elucidating about the fact that they that industry actually prefers having a lot of industries, particularly in certain sectors and certain um, types of research, particularly the the kind of pre-commercial stage, want to be able to work together. So it's not even that just like that. And this is Cross's experience as well as us through the OSPO. So I'm talking to Michael's point about you know the reaction. For, I think oh you could just this doesn't need to be an office. Um, I, I totally get <laughs> like I totally get that pushback, and I think it's I mean. I think it might be it, starting to look at other R1s. Um, I'm not sure. I mean, I'm, I know you and SJ have been probably doing all of these approaches. So I, I like 
we only can give you support to try and help you like figure out the best way of approaching this to your to your your leadership but um i think that the idea that uh that um the our that our ones are doing this might also be the thing to point out like it is becoming more of a and that's part of the push with regards to the uc network the university of california specific network is that we are saying this is now this should be the norm having like a network wide ospo or a, a system wide network is is impartial reaction to the fact that the idea of an ospo or an ospo approach is becoming the norm in um, like r1 universities and other like research and other universities and research institutes so i think maybe it'll be helpful if we have like uh, you know are you're able to point to not just like the fact that ospos are coming up but that things like helios open and other groups are coming in and showing the need for it over trying to think that i mean we i see text transfer offices that can do some of this stuff but i do think even those ones and we've talked about it with that text transfer group uh, the friday one, one friday a, a month text transfer group that we have um that it is hard for them to do both and they seem to want to have those tech transfer offices like in michigan for instance who don't have an ospo are like wow it'd be probably pretty good to have some another organization that was taking over this part because it's hard for us to do both so i don't know i mean those are just my impressions from what i've been been seeing and hearing a follow-up to claire and to stephanie the argument about using open source as a way to make those industry connections it seems to be well received have, have you seen that in practice where corporations have responded positively to that well i mean we had it for a good run for cross i mean we're we're we're, we're switching from the membership to sponsorship model so we don't have like i can't point to it right now but it's five years running 2.5 million dollars so i thought that was a pretty good example of when you can when it works i mean you have to like keep up with changes and we had the changes in our, the sector that had most interest in us, but that doesn't mean that the model doesn't work. Um, and then um, we have like other agreements with, uh, we have one one other large like $2 million grant or something where from an industry that specific, like uh, a co one company, this was just one company where we, they wanted specifically for all the research to be, um, open sourced and we can't like because it's a uc we can't guarantee that we're going to do that this is uc rules uh but we just the intent of open sourcing it in in the gift agreement was enough for the company so yeah okay. i mean i can point to those i mean i think there are i think there are actually more that we haven't been able to track that have that kind of in, in that insinuate that but uh but um that's that's one of the like this next year i think we're trying to integrate that into the full UC network so that we'll be seeing more of those throughout the UC system. Yeah, some of those cases might be nice to see. Um, Claire, did you have, I don't know, <laughs> I'm putting you on the spot in terms well, of. Yeah, so, so, so it's not, it's for, for, for the, the TT, for the OSPO that I know in Trinity, that is, um, that's part of the TTO office. So it's like, it's funded under the TTO office. So their, their metrics are already like, you know, money in translation. And I suppose a point I want to make is that like the, you know, I suppose, or an interesting observation is that they're piggybacking on a process that's already there. So now they're just saying, we're getting more of this thing we know you care about because you've asked us about it repeatedly because, and it happens to be open source. So that's, that's, the, 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 it's the piggybacking on existing metrics rather than coming up with new metrics is an interesting okay. phenomenon. Sure. Okay. And, and then the, and I, I just but but it's just made me think of something that we had had a conversation about and it relates to Mike's suggestion about addressable market um, because uh, because one of the comments that was made in some of these discussions was, I mean, sure, what percentage of like research that's done is is licensed as IP anyway. So if you're looking at what money you get in Trinity, say no, or any any organization, any university. Like the money that folks get for sponsored research from industry, like what percentage is that of all the, re or what percentage of research outputs are licensed or, you know, generate revenue? Um, and I'm guessing it's actually relatively small. So I'm guessing that there's an actual relatively small percentage of all research done that generates revenue. Uh, so when we think about that, I'm just thinking like a small percentage of all open source work done you know, if you could get some sponsorship from industry to do some research, 
that percentage might also be small, but it might be fine. Do you know what I mean? Because it, because if you get any money to do open source research output, that would be a huge increase, for example, in terms of revenue that you would get from a pool of research that mightn't otherwise get any money at all. This is what I'm just trying to think about the idea of how you present that if you were doing a business case. It'd be like an emerging revenue generating area as opposed to like looking at all the research money in the world and saying how much of, like, can I get of that because that's a, that's not necessarily looks very good but the idea of getting a small amount more from a pool of activity that would never generate any revenue that's quite exciting I think if I was a university looking at new revenue diversifying my revenue streams in times when grants are hard to get <laughs> This is so I'll we'll end Mike. Do you, did you have any last comments, Mike? Because I, I want to turn it over to Sean just to kind of see. No, no, yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm happy to turn it over. Well, I will just say this one of based on this conversation, one of the most interesting things that kind of strikes me in this conversation is how much we ended up here at the top. I'm surprised <laughs> by that also. <laughs> and I wasn't expecting I, Mike to talk about sales. So. <laughs> That was uh, very interesting to me. Um, so for what it's worth, it, I think that's certainly a takeaway on this discussion. So thanks for bringing that up, Mike, and, you know, David and Claire and Francesca, and everybody who had comments here. So this is really nice. So I, I do have screen. My screen. Yeah, do, Sean, do you have a comment? I, or? I have one follow-up question on, on Mike's stuff or on Stephanie's comment and specifically when when my university gets licensing dollars back what's interest and i don't know if other universities are like that but i never see that operationally that goes into a foundation that an endowment for the university so it doesn't actually like that success doesn't have any effect on my operating budget whatsoever and i are there other universities that function differently because i would sure like to take those narratives back <laughs> So say, say that again. So you, when you, um, when they, so like when, when software and some of the software I built and other projects have generated a nominal amount of revenue, but all of that revenue goes to uh, an endowment. Like the university does not put it in the operating budget. Doesn't give me any. Like they give me credit for it in my reviews, but they don't give me cash. Oh yeah, and I think in UCS, I have to double check this. It's been a while since I had this discussion, or what happens when for the people who actually are on the innovation side i think that you that we get a very small cut of it and then most of it goes actually to the to as a, a separate thing to the person who's who who created it like they don't take the full any any licensing and i can't remember how they pay it out yeah. but the idea is they want to incentivize people to do it so they um you get you get money back separately um like the the faculty or researcher that does it Okay. Um, but you have to pass, they, there has to be a cut for the, for UC, for them to have gone through all of the licensing, like the legal part that they're yeah. doing their yeah, commission. Like... But, um, but yeah, uh, so I don't know where that commission goes. Um, but I, my understanding is that there is, is that similar to the way patents work, they, they do have, uh, they will allow, uh, they do specifically give the researchers and particularly the faculty, um, you know, money back or in some way I yeah. mean, it, it, it's written in some way that it's not it's not 100 percent that the university gets it and, and the person who yeah i mean for me those very small dollars end up being like i've never seen any of them but it's such a small percentage the university takes almost all of it and it yeah. doesn't like, return to any department level or college level fund yeah i, I mean i i'll actually look into it. i have a meeting come to meetings coming up with my tech transfer first people and I can have, I actually, that's a really good question. I never thought about where the money that they get goes. To. <laughs> I think they get, <laughs> it's I mean, not you probably. Yeah, that's, not me. <laughs> that's okay. I, well, like I like to keep my tech transfer people happy, so I'm okay. With yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, Richard, do you have a comment here? Uh, it's definitely a comment. It's, it's really, I can't figure out how to make this a question uh, except rhetorically. Um, I like what you said about how we focus on the top. Um, it, I think that sounds accurate to me. We are focusing on funding. I kind of want to point out that the stuff on the bottom of Mike's list was also metrics and metrics aren't necessarily, that don't necessarily show the greater interest of education as a whole. 
right? Student satisfaction isn't actually a sign of whether or not they've learned anything. Journal articles isn't a sign of impact in the field. It isn't a sign of having learned anything for the species as a whole. And thinking about money is a sign of what administrators care about and what corporations and funders care about. It's not necessarily what researchers ought to care about at universities. So if we think about universities as being the last bastion of like the humanities and the, the idea of like um, liberal educations, uh, I mean that in the classic sense, then the metrics that we've applied don't really work very well. Now that's not to say let's poo poo all this and start over again and think of something else. I'm just pointing out that like, when I think about education in universities, I don't wanna think about dollar amounts because I wanna think about what we're trying to do here. And I'm wondering how we can, how we can better work those metrics in. And again, Mike, really, this isn't negative. I'm just thinking about like how, how the reflection looks from my end and like, how, how do we make that a bit better? Does that make sense? Yeah, Claire. No, I, I, I just have to, because maybe it wasn't really clear because it was it would happened in the Slack, but I just want to be really clear that we explicitly asked Mike and Sean to talk about the metrics that the universities care about, like what does your provost care about, not what we should, not, not, not what we should. Um, okay, cool. Yeah. yeah, so just we probably didn't make that clear enough. There. No, no, <laughs> and, and I have a retort to that, which is awesome. That's great, but also who cares? what the provost thinks, right? Oh, it's, it's, oh. good, it's, it's good to make oh. it work for them. It's good to have it work for them. It's, it's totally important to understand. I'm just pointing out that when I think about what, what I want from the university, it's not this. But this is really great, Mike. And thank you for coming and thank you for being asked. Um, I just, just trying to like phrase it differently. Does that make sense? Oh, oh yeah, well, 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 well I, I mean, just to, it, absolutely. And, and, and I think that that is, but, but I, I would add, I really do care, like for, 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 for the work that certainly we're doing in Ireland, we absolutely care what the province thinks and what, what the university thinks, because we're trying to get them to put policies in place to actually promote more open source. And if they don't care, this is a way to get them to care because it aligns to what they care about. It's about aligning motivations, right? So I, I, hear, you. About, I hear you. It's, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. political though, right? It's not, it's not like well, the, the end goal. Yeah, it, it, it's is it is important. It's enabling. So it's, yes. it's, it's, a, it's a system issue, I would say, that if, if they don't care, and in fact, if they think it's actually blocking what they do care about, they're going to block it. So it's actually a system sustainability issue for me. I, I, I hear you. I hear you on that. Um, thank you. Like I said, it was a comment. <laughs> it, was, it wasn't meant to derail the entire conversation. I'm just thinking about it. It's like, that's just what I think about when I see these things. Yeah, I, so I, right. I mean, I have a comment on to the comment, but into the comment on the comment, but like it is, it is funny because there are, there are just different forces that interact with each other. And it, yeah. So, so anyway, maybe, yeah, if you I see your hands, I think you kind of understand where I'm going. So, yeah. Um, okay. So maybe we can, um, we have just maybe a few minutes. So Sean, maybe you I have like four minutes to tell us what you think. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think Richard, I mean, I think Michael, Mike covered all, most of the important things. What I have to add is, is really uh, a brief example of how I used um, chaos metrics and, and open source in my own promotion case. Do you want uh, to share your screen at all, Sean? Four years ago, yeah. Yeah, I'll do that right now. Okay. Um, and, and so, the, the story I'd like to tell, because I have all these uh, intellectual property and revenue concerns or considerations that Mike mentioned. Um, but on top of that, I I think for the individual faculty members, one of the questions is how do we how do we motivate faculty members or help them understand what value it is to tell the story of the software that they built? And so just using myself as an example, when I went for promotion from associate professor to full, um, I. I'd created a data science and analytics master's program back in 2013 to 2015 and then um, launched it in 2016 and created a whole bunch of new coursework. And I was able to use the coursework that we kept in repositories on GitHub to, to explain that I'd actually done a significant amount of the lift in terms of creating those courses. And so this single graphic is just an example of, or here are all the TAs and other people who worked on creating these courses. And then these are Sean's commits. And it's pretty clear Sean did a lot of the work um, here. And so this kind of an analysis that's using chaos metrics and chaos tools, and this is the most simple 
straightforward one, but I was talking to uh, my colleagues and administrators who don't understand open source really at all, so I had to keep it simple. Um, I just, I dealt with the commits and these are the commits. And so this for me served as evidence that yes, indeed I did do a lot to create not only the program and lead it through approval, but then actually make the curriculum. And, and I think I'm probably not the only faculty member who uh, could use uh, things that chaos provides or chaos has generated to, to tell a promotion story or a tenure story related to software or even curriculum. I think, I think one of the interesting parts of this is, and I don't know what other people do, but I build all of my curriculum in Git repositories really for the last 15 years. And it helps me tell a story about the work that I'm doing inside my university. So I'll, I'll shut up and see if anybody has comments. This is very narrow compared to what Mike talked about, but it's also sales-like. Well, I think, I think it's interesting because just based on the, the handoff from Mike to you, this is like looking at metrics, kind of the directionality is a bit different. Mm -hmm. So this is metrics to help faculty members think about their engagement, which is quite different than how to help administrators think about the role of the OSPO. Both are important, so I appreciate kind of the, the different directions that we have here. Um, I'm curious if, if, Sean, if you have kind of shared this approach with others at Missouri to, you know, to help them through their own tenure and promotion case, or was this just you? Uh, I've certainly discussed it with my colleagues, but none of them, few of them really are building their courses in GitHub primarily or um, building a lot of open source software. And the ones who do build open source software, I think that, that they tell a different story. So this was useful in my case because it related to curriculum and the teaching part of my portfolio. I think, I think for the folks who work mainly in the Missouri Life Science Center, because we have a very substantial investment in the life sciences here. And of course, there's a lot of scientific open source in the life sciences as well. Um, those colleagues tell a story more along the lines of what Mike told and relate the software that they build to grant funding specifically. And of course, you know, I, I did that narratively in, in, parts of, in, the, uh, in the research part of this portfolio. However, I didn't rely heavily on metrics to do it um, because really at the end of the day, they, when you're talking about research, the universities, at least the R1s, and really any, I think probably R1, whatever category you are there, um, research dollars are the principal measure. So they saw the dollars, that was enough. I didn't need to tell a longer story. So David, I'm, it's really hard for me to follow chat. Are there any questions yeah, that kind of people have for Sean or points in the chat that people want to bring up? Oh yeah, David, to your question on the ORC ID, um, I've added it. Uh, Don actually is the one that even told me it existed on GitHub now. I didn't even know that. So I do, I haven't seen any effect of it. I think I had my ORC ID associated with my GitHub account for a month. So what's the process here? For the ORC ID? An, yeah, there's just an integration now where you can link your ORCID ID to your GitHub. Um, I think it's sort of a one way, so it might not be helpful yet, but it, okay. it, it just started. So ideally it'll be more helpful in the future. Yeah, I haven't seen this either. Okay. Claire had a question, Sean. Yeah. Of course we're on GitHub. Can you share an example? It was, it was just, I, I don't know what courseware on GitHub looks like as an end result. So I just really love to see oh. an example of that. So like your most popular one or something like that, just to show me what that looks like. That'd be really sure. nice. Thank you. Sure, I can, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll go find that and share it with, and that's in the Slack channel. Um, it's gonna be pretty old now because uh, once, I, I'm a, once I created the program and had it successfully launched, I stopped managing it because it's not really my deal. <laughs> <laughs> but I have the I have the stuff we created like you know five years ago or six years ago, and I'll I'll, I'll find that I'll dig that up and share it with you. Is there is there and just I'm just looking at this comment from Mike as well that says his was also old and unused and I'm just wondering, you know, is there is there anything that might point to 
um, courseware that's built collaboratively like that maybe having a longer shelf life than courseware that's built through other mechanisms? So I don't know if there's been any studies about it. Ultimately, it so for me, it, dep it depends on what you're teaching, right? Like I teach a lot of computer science courses and this was a data science program. So for these, for those kinds of courses, uh, building on a GitHub's uh, using, I use Jupyter Notebooks a lot. That's that's almost um, the right way to do it. I think for other for other topics or courses that may or may not be the right way. But I, I manage all the courses I teach, at least in a private repo, even if I don't share anything with the students, because for, I mean, it's like, I just can keep track of stuff better. Like once you start using Git and GitHub, it's like crack. It's it's it makes it so much easier to change stuff and keep track of your history and all that. I think David has his hand up. I have a good case study um, of, a, of how, how it can work really successfully. Um, Lorena created a course probably in 2015 on GitHub. Um, there was a, a Python intro course that she turned into a MOOC. Um, and we are now using that same, I think we forked that GitHub project and are now using that for our Python camp here at the library. So almost 10 years later, and it's still being used um, and, and being, you know, updated yearly. So yeah, it's, that's a good way to go. And with yeah. Jupyter book, you can, you can do really nice things to create an online, um, a nice online tutorial or, or, you know, output PDFs, things like that. Yeah. Our IT organization moved all my data science courseware to um, to an internal GitLab instance because that's what they like to do. And I don't actually have access to it anymore, but I know that they're continuing to just re evolve the things I started with. I just don't have the visibility to it anymore because I don't want that. Because <laughs> that would make it my problem. <laughs> all right. So, Sean, you can stop sharing. Yeah. We're at the end of time. So super interesting conversation for me. And by the way, somebody took a lot of notes. So I was going to go drop some points in there. So whoever took notes, thank you, <laughs> Claire. <laughs> I was not expecting to see that. And that was really amazing. So thank you so much for that, Claire. All right. Um, this was really great, everybody. I really appreciate the conversation. I really appreciate your time. I think we can all take off and have a good rest of the week. All right. Thanks, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye. Everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.